Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jeremy Leffler, and I work in the Policy Office at the National Science Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the first webinar of the 2022 NSF Policy Office webinar series. Today, we'll be covering NSF's current and pending support policy, and I'm joined today by Gene Feldman, head of the Policy Office. Future topics will be announced via the Policy Office Outreach website, and I would encourage you to go to this site and sign up to be notified of upcoming outreach opportunities. You can click on the Get Notified link to sign up for notifications. Uh, we're glad that you're able to join us today, and I'd like to turn it, turn it over to Jean Feldman. Thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here with all of you today, um, whether it be a good morning or a good afternoon. Um, I do apologize with my voice. I uh, am still getting over the dreaded COVID. And so I will do my best to um, make my voice as clear uh, as possible. Next slide, please. Before we actually go into some background and level setting information for all of you, I also would like to recognize uh, Beth Strauser and Samantha Hunter. They are senior policy specialists in uh, the policy office. They answer your questions each and every day. And much of what we also have in terms of meat in this presentation are questions that they have been receiving in the policy at nsf.gov uh, alias. So I just wanted to recognize them for all their very, very hard work uh, as they try to get you those answers uh, to the questions that you submit as quickly as possible. So let's talk a bit about <clears throat> the Biosketch policy background and context, as I've mentioned. The Biosketch has a purpose, in fact, Every single part of an NSF proposal has a purpose. And the purpose of the biosketch is to assess how well qualified the individual team or organization is to conduct the proposed activities. Now, I must tell you that the biosketch requirements um, and the fact that we use those to assess qualifications of the individual team or organization is not new. In fact, if you go all the way back to the first days of the National Science Foundation, um, it wasn't called the PAP Guide then, uh, it was uh, ha had a, an entirely different name. The biosketch was a requirement and we used the biosketch for exactly the same purpose as we do now. We point out in uh, the bio, graphical sketch section that you must include all appointments and those are whether academic, professional or institutional appointments and it's whether or not remuneration is received and whether full-time, part-time or voluntary, including adjunct, visiting or honorary. A point I would like to make about this that's very fundamental is that uh, people are, are throughout this presentation are going to be wanting to ask questions about NSF's um, upcoming implementation of the implementation guidance for um, NSPM 33. Um, I can tell you NSF has already started and has been implementing parts of NSPM 33 for a few years now. And that requirement to identify all of those appointments is directly out of NSPM 33 and the NSPM 33 implementation guidance. So we've got a jump start on this. And I'm going to show you places throughout this presentation where we have already taken advances and step forwards uh, to um, uh, implement the implementation guidance and to make sure, as Jeremy's already mentioned, that our expectations are very clear to both you and the faculty at your organizations. Um, obviously, the biographical sketch also includes synergistic activities, but we do have a reference on this slide to Chapter 2C2F, 
which is where the bias, the complete set of biosketch instructions are. And I want to make sure that if you have any questions on those, um, that you take uh, advantage and go directly to that part of the PAP guide. One point I also wanted to make, we're getting questions on with regard to the appointments is, has to do with professional appointments. And we say we want all of these appointments, whether they're academic, professional, or institutional. But the section does also go on to say, with regard to professional appointments, senior personnel must identify all current domestic and foreign professional appointments outside of the individual's academic, professional, or institutional appointments at your organization. So we, we keep getting questions of, no, no, it looks like you say all, but then when you talk about professional appointments, it seems like it's only those outside of your, of your own academic, academic, professional, or institutional appointments. And that's accurate. And that's why we put that clarity there. We knew that professional appointments would be an incredible administrative burden. And so the foundation took steps to ensure that we got the only the information on professional appointments that we need. Next slide, please. Now we're going to provide a bit of uh, uh, background and context on current and pending support. And as I previously mentioned before, if you went back to the earliest days of the foundation, the foundation also asked for support information. These kinds, this information, this in the bio sketch, help the foundation make good decisions about who to provide support to. We, like back then, used the information to assess the capacity of the individual to carry out the research as proposed, as well as to assess any potential overlap or duplication. Um, information must be provided irrespective of whether it's through the proposing organization or directly to the individual. Again, that is line is a line that is directly in NSPM 33 and in the NSPM 33 implementation guidance. We got a jump start and already have included that in the existing uh, last two PAP guides um, because we wanted to make it very clear that uh, our expectations went well beyond just the support that is provided through the proposing organization. One of the changes that we did make in the last couple of PAP guides was to put a lot of emphasis on in-kind contributions. And um, it, we asked for your feedback on in-kind contributions. And you made it very clear that if it is for the project that is being proposed, it just seemed to make a lot of sense that that be included in facilities, equipment, and other resources. And frankly, we agreed with you. And so we made that change. So the what you're putting in current and pending support is are the in-kind contributions that are not intended for use on the project being proposed and which have an associated time commitment. Again, if we really want to know about the capacity of the, of the individual, we have to have all of the information that has a time commitment in order for us to make those assessments. On this slide, you also see a direct link to the PAP Guide Chapter 2C2H, which you will find the full coverage on current and pending support. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the PAP guide significant changes or clarifications to current and pending support that we recently issued or that went into effect in the last PAP guide that went into effect in October. Um, objectives and overlap were added. Um, 
to the NSF approved formats to help reviewers at NSF assess overlap and duplication. Okay, some questions here that we are getting that we want to make sure that you understand. Some of these I may answer twice because we want to make sure that you have that understanding. The objectives and overlaps are two separate statements. And when you look at the templates, you will see there are two separate boxes for you to fill in, one for objectives and one for overlap. And it's for each of the entries that you have in current pending support. The reason I bring this up and because it's been confusing is that our colleagues at the present time at NIH ask for one statement for the entire current and pending support. That's not how we are doing it at NSF. For every entry, you're going to talk about the objectives and you're going to talk about the overlap because that is going to help us understand any overlap or duplication with the project that is being proposed. The new table. I am super excited to talk about this table because it really has been fundamental in helping you understand NSF's expectations. It's entitled Pre-Award and Post-Award Disclosures Relating to the Biographical Sketch and Current and Pending Support. Next slide, please. Now we have developed a page um, uh, on the NSF website and the reason that this page is so important to all of you is that you're going to see multiple dates and you're going to say, well, for heaven's sakes, why can't you just keep it the same? Why do you keep adding things? Why do you keep changing things? Well, that is because of all of the questions that we continue to get in on a daily basis. And we want to make sure that this table is as accurate and as comprehensive as we can make it. And we keep getting those great questions and say, wow, that isn't addressed on the table. And so this is an extremely vitally important um, uh, tool for use by your faculty. Obviously, as noted here, the latest version of this is January 10th, 2022. Um, and uh, we added information to the table to help you uh, answer some of the questions um, that uh, were not being uh, addressed on the table as it existed. Um, next slide, please. And we're going to go actually into um, the table. OK, so this is the table that we have come up with. And the reason um, that I like this table really well is that um, it goes through our entire proposal and award life cycle. I like this table also because if you look in the NSPM 33 implementation guidance, you're going to see something very, very similar. Um, NSF and NIH work together to develop the table that's in the NSPM 33 implementation guidance. And it is based on this table that NSF and NIH work so hard to harmonize um, to the extent we possibly could to ensure um, that we are as consistent as we possibly can. Now, we have different requirements in terms of FCOI policies, et cetera. So there are going to be some differences, but to the extent possible, we have made this table, which is three pages long, um, be as consistent and as harmonized as possible. So what you're going to find on this table is a listing of um, activities um, along the vertical axis. And then along the horizontal axis, you're going to find where we might ask for this information. And there is a final column 
disclosure not required. And we have found that's equally important because it lets people know, okay, that's not something I have to worry about. And you will also find that exact set of disclosure not required in the NSPM 33 implementation guidance. So again, we're trying some of the things here that NSF has put out are already implementing what's in the implementation guidance and there will be more to come. But some things that I think are particularly important um, to, do, to uh, mention as part of this, again, I said it's our entire life cycle, and that's an important and critical part of the implementation guidance as well, that it does not just start with the disclosures in the proposal, that there are also opportunities after an award is made. There are also opportunities when submitting your uh, project uh, progress reports to the agencies. And so we wanted to make sure the tables included this information um, as well. Um, next slide, please. Now this, um, we're not going to go into each and every one of these. Um, obviously, the language is very, 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 very small. Um, but it is worth emphasizing the fact that um, uh, we did add um, uh, to this slide, the second to the last entry, organizational startup packages provided to the individual from the proposing organization was not included on there. So we have included it on there and included a check mark that disclosure is not required. Um, and we also want to make it very clear that there are things associated with your responsibilities at your institution that we believe that you are handling with your institution. Things like consulting that's already permitted um, by your appointment and um, is consistent with your outside activities, policies and procedures, that the travel supported by your organization is not required, honoraria is not required, um, so we do want to make sure that you take a look at each and every block as we go through this to make sure you understand and your faculty understand the expectations that we have here. Next slide, please. Um, we also have uh, the unrestricted gifts, um, obviously are not required. But I want to make it very clear that um, there is some important language that uh, this is um, right out of the language at the bottom also um, is in the NSPM 33 implementation. Um, and also um, to have you understand that um, if it has any requirements associated with it, you really shouldn't count it as an unrestricted gift. If, it's, if it doesn't meet that definition at the bottom, then it is not a gift and it must be reported. Next slide, please. Now, we also implemented now, not this October, but the prior October, a post-award disclosure of current support. And awardees are required to inform NSF um, uh, if they discover that a PI or a co-PI on an active NSF award fail to disclose current support or in-kind contribution as part of the proposal submission process. This is not something that the PI who discovers it provides to us. The AOR must submit this information and there is a time frame associated with it. It is within 30 days of becoming aware of the failure to disclose. Again, this went into effect October 5th of 2020. 
there is on this particular, uh, in this particular term and condition, there is a lot of information that um, uh, you must uh, answer for us and uh, from an institutional perspective. And um, we have uh, a, we ask you to use the other request in research.gov to submit this information. I can tell you that we have had some instances where there was insufficient space to fill out um, all of the information that um, we were asking. And so NSF will be in the next version of the PAP guide and in the next version of the terms and conditions, we'll be developing a new disclosure specifically for the post-award disclosure of current support so that we can make sure you have sufficient space to answer all of the questions um, and all of the information that we are asking um, you to provide. What will happen upon receipt of this information is that we may consult with you and um, determine the impact of the new information on the NSF grant and where necessary, and really, if necessary, take appropriate action. And what kinds of things we're really looking at are, is there, does the individual with this new information continue to have the capacity to carry out the research? We're also, with this new information, trying to find out whether there is any uh, significant overlap with what's already um, been funded for that individual. And so uh, many times no action is, is necessary, but we take each one separately, one at a time, and look at the information to make sure um, that there is uh, the capacity and that there is uh, no um, significant overlap. This is an opportunity for us to continue. You saw the table, folks. That table that's three pages long is that detailed because you keep asking questions. And we want you to keep asking questions. That way we can ensure that the table continues and any associated FAQs continue to be as comprehensive as possible. That was a very, very clear statement in the NSPM 33 implementation guidance is that people need clarity, they need transparency, they need to understand the expectations. And so we're going to go through, Jeremy's going to ask some questions now, and we're going to go through um, some additional uh, questions that may help with that transparency. Jeremy. Yes, yeah, so um, I do also want to mention that this presentation will be available on, on the policy outreach website. So you'll have these questions and the answers as well uh, as a resource. So the first one is if an individual designated as senior personnel on a project does not have effort in a given year, how does this relate to reporting person months committed to the project in current and pending support? Well, there are there may be instances, let, let me, I want to divide this into two pieces. Um, one, they don't have support in a given year in a multi-year project, okay? If you uh, do not have effort in a one specific year, say you have four years and your activity is in years one, three, and four, but you got nothing in two. You just do not fill out two. You fill out one, three, and four. Um, so you should only report the years that you have the person months on the project. One question that is similar to this that we are getting though, that is problematic. And it's, it's basically what happens if I do not have any effort at all on a particular project that um, I, I am working on. 
um, and I am uh, and I am receiving funding on. The bottom line is what we want to know is in current and pending support for any entry on there. You really have what is it going to take you to complete the scope of work that's assigned to you for that particular project. So there will be time. And, and many are just saying, oh no, I've got some, I don't have any time at all on it. And, and that's because I didn't ask for any time on the budget. We have to make sure if you leave this session with anything at all, Leave it that there is a difference between the time that you're putting to complete the effort in current and pending support and how much money you're asking for from the National Science Foundation on the budget. They are two completely different things and you need to not confuse, and many people are, confusing time and money. So I really just wanted to make that point there because that, that continues to be one of the single biggest issues that faculty do not understand. They'll say, I, I, I just, I, I didn't ask for any money on the budget. So how can I, I, I can't put zero in current and pending support. That's not what we're asking in current and pending support. We are asking for your time commitment so we can understand the capacity and whether you have the capacity. Right, and this, and, and this question actually gets to that, which is, the actual effort on a project will exceed NSF's yeah. two month role. How do we show this on future proposals right. without violating NSF policy? Right, so we're not asking, I, I, I've got, I've given you that, but probably an even better ask, answer is that the two month policy is not at all about current and pending support. That's not what we're trying to get to in NSF's two month rule. The two month rule has to do with compensation, how much oh, that we will pay up to two, two, two person months across all NSF awards. That has nothing to do with current and pending support. And so you need to take that thought process. You're going to, you're looking at it and you're going, oh my gosh, I've got, if you add all my time together, it, it looks like I've got nine months. Well, we're not asking about um, how much compensation from NSF. We're asking for how much time it will take to complete that scope of work. So you have to really, again, separate time and money and move the two month rule out of your thought process when it comes to completing current and pending support. Okay, let's move to the next question, which is, do proposers need to include overall objectives and statement of potential overlap for all current and pending support entries? Okay, I, I just told you I was deliberately going to uh, mention this one before because we are getting this one quite a bit. And again, I do understand that people read our uh, implementation and they read NIH's implementation. And while they are greatly harmonized, this is a difference. So yes, um, do proposers need to include Overall objectives and statements for all, yes. Inclusion of the information on objectives must be provided for all current and pending support. Um, if there's no overlap, you simply have to state that in that separate box. If there is overlap with other project proposals and or contributions, then you would describe that in the statement of potential overlap. And that's to help, that is for your benefit and your faculty's benefits, because it may seem like it's overlap, but 
you may be helping to explain that it may appear, but it isn't, and here's why. And so you're using that statement of potential overlap to help NSF and our reviewers assess any uh, duplication. Um, okay. There Next. is guidance, there is guidance for inclusion uh, in, the, in the current and pending support section of the PAP guide that goes uh, into more detail. Okay, next question is, do I report startup packages in current and pending support? Um, we uh, also, uh, as I mentioned before, this was a recent a uh, series of questions that people were asking and we realized our table needed uh, to um, uh, address that. Organizational startup packages from your own organization are not required to be reported, period. However, if there is a startup package from other than your proposing organization, you must absolutely report that in current and pending support. Okay, uh, next question is, a project that was listed as pending has since been awarded. Do we need to do anything to notify NSF or the program officer that this project will be funded? Um, this, is, this is one that um, uh, is, a, is a very good one because uh, it, it sounds as if um, it is something that we should immediately notify NS or you should immediately notify NSF about. Again, this is something that was listed, so it doesn't have to do with the term and condition. The term and condition is for when you didn't list it. If it's listed as pending and you are fortunate enough that it be awarded, what you have to do is, um, identify that change in active other support in the annual or final project reports. And you only, you don't provide it early, you provide it when they're due. And you're still going to use the same formatting requirements that you do currently for the current and pending support um, uh, that's in Science CV um, or the NSF fillable format. Um, so those, you must use one of those at the same time, but you provide that information at the time your annual or final project report is due. You provide that information. And there is a lot of additional information available um, on uh, the research.gov about project reports website. Okay, next question is, when listing the total award amount, should that include funding requested for a sub-award or should it include the funding requested for the entire project? Good question. Um, uh, and uh, I will tell you that this is, uh, this is one uh, initially where there was some confusion on. The answer, is, however, is very clear. The amount, if you are a sub-awardee organization, only the amount requested or received by your organization as sub-awardee must be provided. If you provided the entire amount, that would be very misleading as to what your organization was receiving from that particular award. The prime organization is going to include the entire amount, including the subawards, but the subawardee organization is only going to provide the total amount requested or received by the subawardee. Okay. Next question is, you've mentioned it a little bit in this presentation, will the disclosure language for consulting be revised to be more aligned with the NSPM 33 implementation guidance? Well, um, that's an interesting question. Um, the consulting language, uh, if you look at the consulting language um, in uh, the um, NSPM, uh, implementation guidance <clears throat> um, is actually um, 
very similar uh, to what you actually see in the PAP guide with respect to um, with respect to whether you have to disclose it to NSF or not. Um, so we are, I mean, I, it's paid consulting that falls outside of the individual's appointment, separate from institution's agreement. That's really um, very complementary to the language that we do already have in the PAP guide. We know that because uh, we wrote that particular section. So we're assisted in writing that particular section. So, but we will, and at the present time are doing a line by line assessment to ensure that it is completely consistent with the NSPM 33 implementation guidance. Okay, if it is discovered after proposal submission that an investigator's current and pending support was incomplete, what do you recommend the proposer do? Well, um, that's a good question. It really does depend on the timing. If it's discovered prior to a deadline date, or in the case of a target date or no deadline, um, or prior to assigning reviewers, you can use the proposal file update mechanism to submit a revised current and pending support. Um, after that time, to ensure that all reviewers are looking at the same exact package of information, you can't use PFU after that point. Um, we are looking at this issue very closely because this is a change that we will need to make as a result of implementation of, uh, as a result of our implementation of uh, the implementation guidance. Um, uh, but we have not uh, come to final conclusions yet on how to best do that. So it, again, um, if it's before uh, the deadline date, uh, uh, assignment of reviewers, no deadline, you use PFU. Otherwise, um, uh, we're working to provide the best solution for ma many of our, our program officers as a matter of the best practice actually already ask for updated um, current and pending support. Um, we want to, however, find a comprehensive electronic system way to do that. And so um, we are looking at that issue a lot more closely as we speak. Okay, uh, next question is, how should cost sharing commitments be included in current and pending support? Well, like the two months rule, cost sharing really doesn't, isn't, um, a, it's not related to current and pending support. What it is, if you're spending time on the project and completing the effort, no matter who's paying for it, that is what should be reported. Again, we have to have a comprehensive assessment of <clears throat> the capacity of the individual. So again, we keep getting these questions in on cost sharing. It's not about the cost sharing and who's paying for it. It's about the time commitment. And that is what we're greatly interested in. Okay, next question is, what is the reason for changing the current and pending disclosure table so often? You keep asking questions. <laughs> you keep asking questions and we want you to know that we do listen to you. In fact, when we're getting in a question, obviously the first thing even we do is look at the table. Look at the tools NSF is putting out there for you. The table has greatly assisted. It has not, however, stopped the questions. Um, I had hoped, wow, we're going to put this great this table out there. It's got 300 lines on it, maybe not 300, maybe that's an exaggeration, but it has a lot of lines on it, but it still is not answering. So that's why we are asking you to continue to ask those questions because we do listen to you. And we do want to ensure that it's as comprehensive as we can possibly make it. 
Okay, so we have time for uh, a few more questions before we, we close out. Um, and so I'm, I don't have them on the screen here, but I do have some additional questions that we received as part of the registration process. And the first one is, how do we disclose a consulting relationship you know, on current and pending support? Again, go back. That's why I was surprised at the language about, or the question about when are we going to align it with the implementation guidance? Because they very much, uh, from our perspective, are aligned. We may tweak it a bit, but the bottom line is reference that disclosure table. Only consulting that falls outside an individual's appointment needs to be disclosed. Um, one other point, though, that um, uh, really should be made, though, is that you shouldn't be using a disclosure, a, a consulting arrangement in order to ensure that you don't have to identify uh, any uh, foreign talent program uh, or other thing of that nature that should otherwise be reported. Okay, the next question is, for postdocs that are funded externally, would the PI mentoring mean an associated time commitment? If mentoring is part of the appointment, then disclosure isn't required. However, if the mentoring is outside of the appointment and there is a time commitment, then disclosure of the information is required in current and pending support and potentially in project reporting as well. Okay, and the next question is, again, how should honoraria, and we just talked about mentoring, um, how should those be, cap how should honoraria be captured in current and pending support? If you look at the pre and post award disclosure table, you'll see that honoraria does not require disclosure. Um, I can tell you what is exciting is that NSF and NIH did um, work together to develop a standardized definition of honoraria, which we will be including in <clears throat> the next issuance of the PAP guide, and we're going to build it into the table as well as a definition to ensure that when we say honoraria, it means the same thing that you think honoraria means. Um, so uh, the exciting part is that, no, you don't have to report it, but we are making sure that there is consistency among the agencies on how that terminology is to be defined. Okay, the next question is, um, should current grants be listed first followed by pending submissions or is there a required order in the, uh, when completing the, the, the current pending document? Well, you should group the end, uh, entries together based on the status of support. And there is a box that you'll have to complete and are in the order of current to pending from top to bottom. But this is, this is something that um, uh, we worked when developing the system to make sure that it works and that we all of the current and then it goes down all the way through the pending so that the current are, are the ones that are um, uh, on top. Okay. And you talked about uh, including the amount of the subaward, but is there a reason or is it is there a way that or a reason for us to indicate somehow that it is a subaward um it's not necessary well frankly there isn't a way to uh, really uh, make that clear um there isn't a box there isn't something you check um so it's not necessary to indicate that it's a subaward you're only indicating the dollar amount and the amount of time, because again, that gets back to the very purpose of what we're asking the information for in the first place. Okay, and we have time for one more question. And that is, uh, in cases where a PI has a current project listed on the current and pending support, 
and they have expended the, the salary support that they receive, are they allowed to include a notation regarding the fact that the award uh, awarded support has been expended or should they just delete the entry at this point? No, again, let's get back to it. What is it about capacity? If the PI still has effort on the project, irrespective of whether or not they've expended the salary support, it must still be included on current and pending support in order to give NSF program staff and our reviewers uh, the necessary information to help make good decisions and recommendations to the foundation. Okay, um, I have one last slide here and there are a lot of resources available on this slide. Uh, first and foremost, the proposal and award policies and procedures guide, which was mentioned, oh, maybe a couple of times uh, during this presentation. <laughs> uh, that's your go-to for uh, NSF proposal and award related policies. We also have the policy office website on that page uh, are uh, pa links to pages for both the biographical sketch and current and pending support. And those include direct links to the policies and the PAP guide, as well as to links to the approved formats uh, and to FAQs uh, for current and pending support. The disclosure table that Jean spoke about earlier is linked here. So make note of that. And I've also included a link to the policy office outreach page where you can find many on-demand resources, including presentations, uh, panel discussions, and other materials. Uh, this includes on-demand presentations from the fall 2021 uh, grants conference, as well as information on how to uh, register for upcoming webinars and conferences. I do want to remind everyone that we are currently planning the spring 2022 grants conference and that's scheduled to take place during the first week in June. So if you haven't done so already, please, you can go to nsfpolicyoutreach.com and sign up to be notified about this. We will be posting this uh, session and uh, on, on the policy outreach website and on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Go ahead, Jean. Yeah, I, I really wanted to emphasize this was a, a, bra a brainchild, this concept of doing topic specific uh, outreach uh, was the brainchild of the entire policy office staff. So I thank my team for coming up with this great idea, but we would greatly, greatly appreciate um, your perspective on whether you believe this is helpful. And if it is helpful, um, what kinds of topics in the future do you think it would be good for us to address and would be most valuable to you? Um, so uh, I hope that everyone has a uh, fabulous rest of their day. I hope uh, the dreaded COVID stays away from all of you. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>